I thought I'd take a little break from my feeble attempts at blow-by-blow -blow coverage. Don't forget I'm also blogging daily or semi-daily on Straight Up and give you a step-by-step -step description of how my days usually go here at the games. To really give you a taste of the old, the cultural experience, I'll insert the odd Britishism into the post with a translation in my, in my parentheses. If you don't give a rip about such trivia as my daily preambulations, my apologies. I'll be blogging about the show jumping as soon as the speed class is over. I've landed the sweetest of sleeps here in London. What better way to get on the inside of a place than to accept an invitation to stay in someone's home? I have a friend who works for a British horse publication you would almost certainly recognise. It might just have equines and canines in its name. She just happens to live a half hour bus ride from Greenwich. Yes, just one bus. And the last stop is my stop, so I can't possibly miss it. Lowcog made one of the best logistic decisions they could have, at least for those of us who got who, who got a fully loaded Oyster card. Now, that's what they call the smart card transit passes here. Uh, usually at these gigs, I, I don't stay in the official media accommodation and I'm therefore SOL for free transit between the venue by my, by my, by my bed. Ah, but, but, but not so in London. I can go anywhere I want, on train, subway or bus, for free. At least I haven't sufficiently conveyed this impression in my previous posts. This is easily the most well-run Olympics of the three I've attended. And I have yet to encounter any but the tiniest and most inconsequential of glitches. Ten days in, take that, nay saying presidential candidates. So, I rise in the morning, sometimes as early as I have to, sometimes as early as I choose to, make a cup of the Starbucks Instant I thought to throw in the bag at the last minute, and consult the weather forecast before finalising wardrobe for the day. Not that there is much point in checking the weather, for two reasons. The London weatherman is never right, and it rains a little or a lot every single day. I think cross-country day is the only day since I've arrived that the skies didn't weep at least a little, which means one non-optional item in my backpack is my waterproof. That's Brit speak for rain jacket. I've had quite a few chances to test it, particularly while watching the first day of dressage. On the topic of waterproof clothing, the Olympic volunteers and staff have been left out in the cold. Or the rain. As it were, as, I, uh, as hard as I find it to believe, the purple jackets issued to them are not even water resistant. Never, never mind downpour proof. And it's not like rain is abnorm an, an anomaly uh, around these parts. I've forgotten how to speak English. <laughs> when it cries out, we have lots of soggy, unhappy purple, purple people around. In stark contrast to the preamble clothing of the low-cog folks, Team GP outfitted its athletes and various support squad members in head-to-toe or weather wear, including rain pants and brolly. That's an umbrella. Another fly in the purple ointment is that low-cog decided to put the staff and the volunteers in identical outfits, which means no one can tell the difference. The usual protocol at the Olympics is to give staff and volunteers differently coloured uniforms so that one knows who to ask directions to the loo, the restroom, and who to ask where the official results will be available in the media centre. I spoke to a volunteer on my bus last night who said she gets, she gets asked an awful lot of questions she can't possibly answer and even she can't differentiate in order to send people to an employee who would know the answer. The most dangerous moments in my day are the road crossings. This is not my first visit to the land of the left. England, Scotland, Ireland, New Zealand, Hong Kong. But I can never get the hang of looking right first instead of left. Except in the city centres where they have very conveniently painted look left, look right at the crosswalks. For those millions of tourists like who me are habitated to cars on the left. My solution is to continuously swing my head from side to side in a 180 degree arc as I step off the curb. I'm sure it makes me look mildly disturbed as I'm as if having a disagreement with my invisible friend. <laughs> but it's a small price to pay not to have both my legs broken or worse. 
When I alight from, let's get off, my bus, it's just a short walk to the accredited entrance, which is also the main entrance for the riders. I get nicely in the mood for the day, with guaranteed sightings of the likes of Patrick Cattell, can't miss him, he's ten feet tall, and Marcus Enning, easier to miss, he's near munchkin-sized. I don't know of any equestrian teams that are making use of the dorm-style accommodations at the Olympic Village. Everyone is installed in hotels within walking distance of the venue. Uh, the, the whole neighbourhood feels like it's become, become part of a special equestrian athlete's village. Sightings of riders and their families are as common as raindrops around here, especially at the better eateries like Café Rouge and Davies Wine Bar. Last night, when I had left the venue, I saw Danish dressage team riders, Natalie and Anne, strolling down the street, licking ice creams. <laughs> and of course, the Greenwich Tavern is always overflowing into the streets, especially since the party animal jumpers are now in the hood. This oversized example of British kitsch greets me every morning as I approach the media workroom, which is located in an airy and bright wing of the National Maritime Museum. Best media centre I have ever had the pleasure of using. Here's another defining feature of this Olympic media experience. What with all the media frenzy, feeding frenzies during eventing, royals, and dressage, Romneys. This first day of shoe jumping is the quietest spin since the Olympics started. Usually it's the other way around. Food is decent and easily accessed. None of that artery clogging fried chicken and pulled pork of Kentucky. But if the selections in the media canteen are not up to my personal snuff, I have time to visit to the to the food venues at the stadium. Not to I I, I apologize, I've got that wrong. I have to time my visit to the muse, the few venues at the stadium not to coincide with a break in order to avoid participating in that very British of pastimes queuing. I have never watched so much of the action from inside the media centre, but unless I need to get out to the mix zone to talk to a rider, I found myself parked for hours on end in front of one of the ten or so CCTV monitors in here. There are no covered press tribunes in the stands, and with the roulette wheel where the change is, I wouldn't dream of taking my laptop up there. I like to multitask and blog while I watch, so here I am, comfy, and none the worse for watching a monitor instead of the 3D reality. Once the day competition comes to a close, I either stay in Greenwich and have dinner with my partners in media crime, or head back to my digs. A couple of hours of Olympic coverage on TV, or on my laptop, BBC is the absolute Bond for live coverage of multiple channels and online. Finally, I kip down, go to bed, maybe with a bedtime snack of Worcester flavoured crisps, chips, or Cadbury's crunchy biscuits. I woke up yesterday with one of those biscuits melted into the bed sheets. Whoops. <laughs> and slip off to the land of Nod. And then do the whole thing again the next day. Tip top, bang on. Cheerio!